Welcome back, gang. It's Deltia from DeltiasGaming.com, here to give you my opinion on the year 2021 in the Elder Scrolls Online. I returned to content creation in the game in early February of 2021, and I felt like it was a roller coaster year with big ups and big downs. Companions were the main feature and selling point of the Blackwood chapter, and we had no real changes to PvP, but some incredible new zones, storytelling, and dungeons. This begs the question, was 2021 a good year for ESO? Well, yes and no. <music> 2021 saw a year-long adventure called Gates of Oblivion with three DLCs along with a new chapter. The first DLC, Flames of Ambition and Update 29 were released on March 8th of 2021 for PC for 1,500 crowns or free with an ESO Plus subscription. This DLC added two new group dungeons, Black Drake Villa and The Cauldron. The two new dungeons were a great addition to the game that already had a plethora of dungeons. One main reason why, the new dungeons both contain relevant end-game gear sets in both PvE and PvP, giving massive replayability to both the initial clear and completions of achievements and farming of the gear sets. The second reason, Zoth's difficulty scaling, making the dungeons both accessible and super challenging. Take for instance Black Drake Villa on normal, it's very easy. Veteran mode, eh, somewhat easy for the average group, while the hard modes can be challenging and add another layer of complexity and difficulty with the secret bosses and you have a variety of challenges and plunders to collect. That's essentially a four-tier dungeon with scaling rewards and achievements, and this is where ESO truly shines, its instance-based PvE content. Where ESO didn't shine is the massive overhaul of mechanics, and Update 29 saw champion points radically change. The too long didn't read here is the quote-unquote removal of champion point caps while changing the constellation to three rather than nine, with four possible slottables per three constellations. What did this really do? Not much, to be honest. Most people take the exact same four slottables per constellation in PvE with very little variety outside of off-meta builds. Moreover, the cap removal wasn't entirely true, as your power was essentially capped at or around 1,500 champion points. Beyond 1,500, you receive no more passives that amplify your combat power, instead receive some convenience with changing slottables easy without spending gold. And this is where ESO really dropped the ball, with CP. This constellation has all sorts of fun passives that do not require a slottable, which passively add non-combat perks. Take Inspiration Boost Passive, increasing your crafting inspiration gain by 10% per stage. This can help level your crafting skill line with zero impact on performance and does not require a slottable. Or take the Breakfall Passive, reduce your fall and the damage taken by 7% per stage. The issue is this, why are all the fun, non-performance based passives in one constellation, the green one? There should have been a lot more passives, non-performance based, added to the Fitness and Warfare constellation to give endgame players incentives beyond the power cap of 1500. ESO didn't remove the cap, they just made it seem so with no real endgame incentive to keep progressing. This system continues to fall flat as progression system and the rework gave more confusion rather than clarity. This update also saw a massive overhaul to armor system and you'll start to catch a theme here in 2021. Massive, and I mean massive reworking of core mechanics. Not just once per year, but every single update. All armor passes now scale per piece of armor equipped rather than granting some bonus for five pieces or more. A couple of big ones that changed the major dynamics in PvE and PvP were the Prodigy passive giving spell crit per piece of light armor worn, the Agility passive giving weapon damage per piece of medium armor worn. While this took some getting used to, I will say it did open up a lot of flexibility in builds. For the initial DLC in the year, I really enjoyed Waking Flames DLC. The dungeons are absolutely right and I still love running them today. I constantly take my new tank builds with 3 DPS and no healer into the cauldron as a check to see how my sustain feels. And I spent countless hours farming Black Drake Villa for Kinraw's daggers and fire staffs. ESO's dungeon DLCs are always good as a content creator and I'm a huge fan of 4 player instance based content rather than large scale trials. Why? The 4 players are much easier to get a group, they feel more intimate. And also you can use the dungeon finder and even play them on the normal mode solo. Whereas trials take more coordinating, planning and less winging it. 
The Blackwood chapter was up next in the year-long content cycle and was released on PC June 8, 2021. This was a yearly chapter that required an extra purchase beyond ESO Plus subscription, and the Blackwood chapter upgrade cost $39.99 USDA, with a collector's option as well. In my opinion, Blackwood was controversial. The main selling point behind Blackwood was Companions. From my experience, it's a watered down version of Companions from other games like Fallout 4, Star Wars The Old Republic, and even Skyrim to some extent. I imagine Companions were made to target folks who primarily enjoy the story and needed some help in combat situations, whether they were a new player or someone struggled with the combat themselves. For the end game player like myself, I found very little use to them. I leveled up their skills and you had to do some repetitive quest grinds from the Mages Guild and Daunton Fighters Guild alongside collecting some new gear sets. Most of the time, to be honest with you, I forgot they were even in the game. I'll probably get a lot of heat for this, but I think the companions were one of the last things the game needed as a chapter release. A new class? PvP redesign? A new weapon skill line? A third morph? A new guild? Something. But companions? I don't know. They were not for me, and it felt like a watered-down overall chapter compared to some of the past. But on the bright side, ESO continues to release things they do well, which was a new 12-player trial, Rock Grove. What makes this trial spectacular is the pace and urgency you feel as you progress through it. The first boss encounter? Meh, just a lizard Argonian. However, as you approach the second boss with a big, beautiful-looking blue oblivion portal behind it, the scale, the difficulty, intensity ramp up. This leads to the dramatic conclusion final boss with massive lava flowing from the sides twisting paths and flights of stairs the stake feels high and the excitement even higher this is an amazing piece of storytelling and pve that will be cherished for years to come not to mention the gear and the replayability are extremely high I have a lot of the gear sets collected, but generally love just doing the trial because it looks so unique and feels very oblivion, but with large groups of friends. Blackwood also introduced a ton of new story content, which I typically don't do because I'm focused on collecting gear and polishing builds, and of course, killing things and fighting. The new zone was another home run, and I remember looking day one on the public test server. What stuck out to me was the detail, like the bricks on the wall, the intricate structure and detail of everything felt like oblivion. I remember walking up to one of the walls and going, wow, this feels just like the oblivion game. Even the house parked inside the wall felt cozy and protected from the demon horde just outside. It's those little details that Zoss does exceptionally well and a great area to explore. Zenimax Online Studios also introduced new powerful mythic gear pieces that are considered best in slot to this day. Gaze of Sithis, a heavy headpiece, primarily used in PvP. Harpooner's Waiting Kilt, medium legs, primarily used in Trials PvE. Death Dealer's Fate, used in both PvE and PvP and considered one of the best all-around mythics in the game. These mythics were a massive pain in the butt to collect, and instead of some fun Tamriel-wide scavenging hunt, it turned into a nightmare, sinking countless hours into mundane and repetitive tasks. Take Gaze of Sithis, for instance. The lead you had to do was some random base daily through the Dark Brotherhood Guild. I can understand and appreciate Zoss trying to revitalize old content, but the fact that it was per character, which required the skill line to be level 4, with the passive, made zero sense. And who could forget the water alchemy mat farming in Shadowfin to get the lead for Harpooner's Waiting Kill? You had literally every node in Shadowfin camped by one or more player waiting to loot every 5 minutes just to get that lead. And still to this day, you still see people hanging out on those nodes. I I'm all for new and creative ways to scavenge hunt and collect super powerful items in ESO. I love doing dungeons, even DSA to get Death Dealer's Fate, I enjoy. But these leads promoted isolation, not group unity, and it's counterintuitive to MMORPGs. Blackwood also saw the gutting of Battle Spirit Health Recovery, removing the old school high health recovery builds and playstyles. And my beloved Templar got an absolute boost by the scaling of Living Dark off max health and spell damage and buffing focus. Thanks, Zoss. This was the highlight of the chapter for me. And for PvP in this chapter, we got, wait for it, nothing. Shocker. For those people who constantly tell me in the comments that this isn't a PvP game, I beg to differ. In fact, look at the game's original marketing, trailers in 2013 and 2014. It was about obtaining the Ruby Throne. ESO was about Cyrodiil. In fact, I'm old enough to remember when ESO had buffs inside of Cyrodiil that extended to PvE. Meaning, if you wanted extra stats, critical rating, etc., your faction had to have Emperor, the Scrolls, and the Keeps. While controversial 
controversial, your faction had to give a crap about your home campaign and the impact of Cyrano. Thus, every evening, PVEers would log in, zerg their campaign to get the buffs, and then go do their raiding. Cyrodiil mattered then. It doesn't matter at all now. And if we were being completely honest with ourselves, let's compare Blackwood Chapter to Morrowind, what I consider the absolute best chapter in the game's history. Morrowind gave you a massive, beautiful zone, story that just felt like the OG Morrowind game. Blackwood could be argued the same with the Oblivion style and story, but the chapter also gave you a new class, the Warden, which may or may not have led to my Templar burial video. Yeah, I'm going to move on from that. Regardless of what you think, this was a massive addition. Meanwhile, Blackwood gave us Companion, which I forget most of the time are still even a thing. Blackwood did give us a top-notch trial, but Morrowind gave us Battlegrounds, which has received nearly no support or attention throughout the entirety of its existence. Yet, I still absolutely love playing them every single day and consider it my favorite part of the end game, even though there's very little incentives to do so, unlike PvE. Delta, that's not fair, you're a PvP fanboy. Okay, fine, let's compare the expansion Greymore. Greymore in chapter included a new zone, Western Skyrim, with a whole new Black Reach Cavern, also redoing the Vampire and Werewolf skill lines, a new main storyline, a massive new 12 player trial, and also a new system, Antiquities, for farming the mythics. They had new delves, public dungeon, standalone quest line, and two new skill lines, scrying and excavation, along with new world events. The new system for antiquities and collecting mythics is used by nearly all endgame players today and has constantly new mythics to collect. Why I don't agree with the means to collect them, they are relevant regardless if you're a role player or sweat lord PvPer. Nothing against the developers here. Their hard work and passion they put into the game, the creation of this chapter Blackwood is commendable, but I think it was a total miss looking back six months later. Next up, we have another DLC, The Waking Flames, launched on August 23rd, PC, 1500 crowns or free with ESO Plus subscription. Another absolute home run in PvE because of the two new dungeons, The Dread Cellar and Red Petal Bastion. I'm 100% in love with Zoss's new dungeon content design and theme. It's accessible for the average player just wanting to do normal or veteran and collect the gear. But the three-stage hard modes with secret bosses gives you something to come back and do in a super super sweaty challenge outside of trials. When the Dread Cellar was on the public test server in its full glory before the nerf, this dungeon was one of the hardest encounters I've ever done as a tank. The final boss still gives me chills walking to the main room. Not to mention the gear is amazing alongside awesome incentive titles, dies, achievements. This four player PVE is at its finest and one of the best all time. But there's downsides because of course there is. Zoss introduced three new sets obtained through PvP Rewards of the Worthy, meant to break up ball groups, allegedly. Sweat Convergence, I mean Dark Convergence, Plague Break, and Hrothgars and Chill. Each of which of these item sets were extremely overtuned, and we warned the developers on the public test server. When me and my friend John and I test Dark Convergence on the public test server, I nearly one-shot him as a solo player with 38,000 resistances on his Dragonite. I thought no way would this make it to live. Yep, sure did. Next, you had the endless CC grapefruits nuking you in one shot. Combined with the release of New World, you saw a mass exodus of the open world PvPers flee Cyrodiil on PC and A, and frankly, it's never recovered. I primarily PvP in Cyrodiil on PC EU now because of this. During this three-month period, I considered this to be the lowest point in ESO's PvP history. I pretty much stuck to Battlegrounds and just PvE because of these new item sets, the lack of population, and the balancing even worse than the Viper meta days. It was nice to see the developers to try to come up with the item sets that would break up fights and kill ball groups. But like I said on the public test server, all it did was incentivize ball groups to use the sets against solo or small group players and completely gutted my enjoyment of PvP for months. I don't mean to be dramatic here, but this was a major downside for me in my enjoyment of the game. There was light at the end of the tunnel, however, and that was in the form of the Deadlands DLC, currently 2,000 crowns and free with ESO Plus subscription. This featured an overland zone and massive quality of life improvement. If you're a quester, you probably love this zone and the conclusion of the year-long story. The zone was filled with spectacular details and a variety of landscapes and a true showpiece for the company in its world building. But to me, someone who focuses on killing and combat, I have very little interest in the zone because it provides very little replayability beyond the initial thrill. Overland gear can be bought from the traders, the world bosses that rove around aren't that hard to solo, and with no new dungeon, there wasn't a whole lot for me to do in this area. However, the base game came with the armory system, allowing you to 
switch builds seamlessly and two free slots. This is especially nice for console players that don't have 25 atoms that hold their hand like us PC players. And I use this feature every day, for instance, to swap from a vampire PvP build to a PvE DPS with a click of a button, and I absolutely love it. Also, another huge boon for the game was the curation item system, set drops, giving you much better chance to collect the gear you want and filling out your sticker book, collecting the item sets that are relevant for you in your build. Sauce has done a great job in recent years easing up the unnecessary gear grind while still giving you incentives to collect and obtain items. This just makes it easier to run stuff as a group because everyone in the group has an incentive to collect something in their sticker book. And of course, we had some combat changes primarily to the Dragonite class, giving them insane resource sustain and damage, making DKs the kings and queens of PvP at the moment. Well, minus my Templar, of course. Zoss also adjusted the overperforming item sets from Reward of the Worthy in the previous patch, making PvP way more fun, but still lacking anything new, incentives that are closely resembling PvE. Overall, this patch was a home run for me and brought balance back to the force. PvP feels a lot more fun, and I enjoy the new armory system and collecting the gear sets that have been really painful for a long time. If we look at the year and its totality, we got a massive year-long story with new zone Deadland. Four new dungeons, each which were completely amazing and relevant gear to this day and are just fun to play. A new trial rock mode, which could be argued as the best to date. Companions, which I thought were a total miss, but some folks might like them and debate that. And a regression and fun and enjoyment in PvP. Nothing new, little incentives, and New World's impact is still felt to this day. Being 100% honest with you, I think ESO took a step back in 2021. Neglecting one aspect of the game in PvP while releasing Companions as the main selling point didn't hit the mark, and I felt previous years had much more offer in the content cycle. I don't want ESO to become a crafting writ simulator in a dead PvP game. Maybe I'm in the minority on this opinion. Maybe I'm in for a big surprise, but what do you think? That leads into 2022. What in the world do you think Zoss will do? This isn't a shot at the studio. The people there are truly passionate about the game, its direction and future, and I think we're in good hands. But I'm wanting more in 2022, and I'm hoping for the best. Thanks for watching.